protecting us and providing for us, Lord. Thanks for leading us. Thanks for following after and surrounding us with joy unspeakable, full of glory. The coat of fire, the glory of God in the midst of us. Vision to see things that are unseen. Hearts to comprehend the incomprehensible. And Lord, a strength and will to carry out what you whisper in our heart. Thank you, Jesus, for causing everything to work together for good for your children who walk with you in the Holy Spirit. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Praise God. Anybody have a prayer answered uh, recently? You got a job. Awesome. Oh, boy. Better be a blessing than a curse, right? Yeah, amen. <laughs> she would get up at another, another job. job. You need to get another ring for her for the other hand. My peeps tell me that somebody bought her some new rings. It's wonderful. Yeah. She deserves it. She's my princess. I was going to say you get a good deal on her, too. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Congratulations on the job. That's awesome. Eric, uh, what's going on? Oh. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah so all these things are floating. Time's floating, right? What's it supposed to be actually now? 10.15. 10 10.15, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. We'll take it. As long as we can read the clock, we're winning. Amen. As long as we can turn the calendar page, we're winning. <laughs> I've always wondered why people don't just schedule things earlier in the summer yeah. instead of having to pretend it's earlier or hey, later, I mean. We've got a couple of states, kind of don't we, dumb. that don't play ball, don't we? A couple of states, I think, in America that don't don't go with this, right? Right. Two or three, I think, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's going to be a revolt and we won't do it anymore. I don't I know. I think Florida was not full time. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. Say things, so. Hard to figure. I have enough trouble when, when I do know what day it is, you know. I found out over the past year that when we think it's noon, it's not even really noon. <laughs> yeah. Because we're on one side of the time zone. So when we have noon on our clocks, it's noon in the middle of the time zone. But over here, it's morning. Wow. 
1230. <laughs> Things that make your head spin. Amen. vision earlier this week when I was praying, kind of a, just a, a faith image kind of, it came without me trying. I just want to share it, be a blessing, kind of goes along with what we're singing about this morning. I was thinking about how so often we feel inadequate and we doubt, we doubt, we doubt our own ability to do things um, 
our ability to accomplish what we think we're supposed to do, and so on. And on the other side, we have our faith in God. And I saw the scale in my mind's eye, and it was like I saw on the one side was, here was us, our, our person, and all of our doubts, all of our weaknesses, all of our shortcomings. And then I saw, it was like God was saying, focus on the other side, put the, put the other side on the scale, which is faith in God, faith in His ability, trust that He will make up what you don't have. And when I saw that like appear and go on the other side of the scale, it was like whoosh. And it, it, you could see the scale, like it was like kaboom. But the last part of it was I was I was thinking when I saw that happen, I saw what was on the other side of the scale. It zoomed up into the sky. Just wow. from the weight of God's yeah. God's uh, favor, the weight of God's supply, right? It just sends us into wow. orbit. Right. So I really I just want to encourage you. Boy, the power of the will, the power of your own choice, what you focus on, what you choose to believe. Amen. Quit quit doubting. Quit putting all of your attention, your energy into your doubt and put your energy, put, give your whole heart to Amen. God's Amen. ability and His, His uh, grace. Praise the Lord the fact that He can make happen what you know needs to Amen. happen. And you'll zoom up. <laughs> you'll zoom up into the heavenlies. We'll be airborne. Praise Amen. God. That's a good word. Thanks, son.
I feel like the Lord's saying some of us in the room today feel like we're sitting in complete, absolute, utter darkness with no light. And I feel like he's reminding us to remember the words that he spoke through the prophet Isaiah. Who is as blind as my servant? Who, who is as confused as the one that does my will? The one who sits in darkness, let him trust in my name. Let's believe God. Amen. Even in darkness, let's believe and think, meditate on his name, Yahweh. He's ever present. He's the eternal. He always was. He remains. He always will be. He is the source behind everything that we see. And he's constantly creating new things. He's constantly moving us from faith to greater faith, from glory to greater glory. He said to John in Revelation, Behold, I'm making all things new. He's constantly creating the fruit of our lips to give thanks to his name. He's constantly changing the environment, the circumstances. He's constantly changing the scene, but he does it by means of the unseen. Some of us are right in the middle of the process. But remember, even when the earth became full of darkness. The Spirit of the Lord brooded over the waters. And then finally God spoke, Light be. And the darkness withdrew and the light was manifest. The darkness is fixing to go backwards in your life. And the true light is going to shine. And what a surprise when you see what he's been working on. When you couldn't see your right hand or, or your left. Father, thank you for what you're working on behind the scenes. Thank you for your name, your presence, your character that we can trust even in the midst of what seems like utter darkness. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory today for being the God who changes not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what you've done for, for others in the past you will do for us because you've never changed. Thanks, Lord, for the grace to be disciples. Thanks for a new view. Thanks for a new experience in God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can have a seat. Good day to be in the house of the Lord.
Morning, folks. Thanks for coming along. Good to see you today. Some come from far places. Yes, that's right. We all paid attention, changed the time, and actually lost an hour's sleep to get here. Hallelujah. Some come from a fur piece, as they say, across the border. Appreciate you making the drive. I think it's always worthwhile to come together. Amen. Wasn't that a neat service last week? Boy, the end of that service was just like, like the old days, praying for each other. And always feel free to do that. Again, after the service this morning, you know, we don't get a lot of people usually for prayer up here, but, and that's fine. But, um, yeah, feel free to move among your, the pews and see who's got what need and gang up on everybody. Amen? Pray, pray till it hurts. I hope you got your bulletin with you. Do you believe that we went over budget last week? Wow. Yeah, that's just so awesome because we so seldom even meet it. And to go over, that is just really cool. Some folks I, I found out were able to make up some of what they were wanting to give. And it kind of all hit at the same time. And that was really, really nice. So appreciate you folks thinking of us. Um, got a nice letter from uh, this fellow, Shama. He's written before. He's one of our students in Africa. And he sent a follow-up. I'm so glad to hear, he's talking to um, Solomon, I'm so glad to hear from my fellow bond servant in Christ. I'm called to be an apostle with a gift of prophecy. So the courses I am doing with you, like this first one, have changed my life. It is widening my heart and making me approve to God as a worker who's, right, right, uh, who's rightly handling the word of truth. May God bless you with all spiritual blessings. He said in the previous email, uh, he just signed up and he said, I'll, I'll be teaching this to, uh, to my friends and my my co-workers, so that's a really good testimony. Got an uh, email the other day from someone, um, it was either in India or Africa, I forget, one of our students, but uh, they were saying something along the line of they were learning more in the courses than they'd learned in Bible college and seminary. So I think that's a good, good report, you know? And we don't charge them what they do, so that's also a blessing. Amen. You see the, the Holy Week service there? Uh, we don't always have the church open on Good Friday, but we're going to do that this year. Um, it's all there in front of you. Monica is singing on Easter Sunday morning, which will be very nice. Um, Good Friday will be here. The church will be open from noon till 3, and you can serve your self-communion. Some people you haven't been here or don't go regularly, don't know what, you know, what am I supposed to do. No, you don't have to wait for any minister to show up or to be here because we will have prayed over the elements, and they will already be consecrated. So just say, serve yourself. Um, how long do I have to stay? Well, you don't have to stay at all. Um, we've had people come for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour. Some people come for an hour or more. Uh, we've actually had some people that aren't members come here because they kind of know it's open usually every year, nearly every year. Uh, so yeah, just whatever your schedule allows and just spend some time. I, I kind of encourage you to read through the, um, the accounts of the passion of Christ during that time. Look at all, you know, three, uh, four gospel accounts, primarily the, the synoptic gospels, the first three. But if maybe you even have one of those Bibles that has those together, that's really nice to kind of see the. It's like looking at a diamond. Each writer sees a little different picture of the same event, and that's kind of nice. Another thing I would suggest to you is think about your own life in the in the light of the life of Christ, um, what He let go of, what He sacrificed, and maybe think about what what do I need to let go of? What do I need to unload? You know, uh, what do I need to die to? What am I carrying around that's weighing me down? And then you might want to also think about what can I add that I'm not doing right now? In other words, it's almost like a New Year's resolution time, even though it's not January. You'd be surprised what a couple of uh, hours in the presence of God at a particular time, at a particular place, for a particular reason can do. It'll bless you. Uh, Palm Sunday, uh, our normal service, and then on, good, on uh, Resurrection Sunday, we'll have our... our um, birthday celebration also. And pray for Cliff. Uh, Solomon and I saw him. Charlie sees him. Ron just talked to him. Uh, it, for a while it seemed like he wasn't quite maybe knowing who we were. I'm not sure. It didn't seem exactly right because of this sugar imbalance. He's had several falls. That never helps. How many know that? So, um, but I think maybe he's turning a corner and we'll hope to see him back. He's in rehab right now. So uh, pray for Cliff. If you have your Bible with you, let's look at uh, Habakkuk chapter 2. Everybody say Habakkuk. Yeah, when you get to heaven, you don't want to mispronounce the dude's name, do you? 
Habakkuk. Chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Habakkuk. Right? No, it's in the Old Covenant. <laughs> One of the minor prophets. You know who they are, the ones that aren't so important. No. <laughs> One of the 12 shorter books, amen? Oh, boy, what did the pastor have for breakfast? Didn't have none. That's a problem. Um, Habakkuk chapter 2. We're looking at verses 2 and 3 today, but we're going to begin with verse 1, just kind of set the, the stage. This is, uh, gosh, this is history about right around 2,500 years ago. But I think as you look at it with me today, as we think about the concept of writing it down, it's, uh, it's about as fresh for us as, uh, as today's news, even though it took place about 2,500 years ago. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This is the prophet himself kind of letting us know where he's at, what he's doing, and what's perplexing him. Maybe you and I could probably sit down beside him when we think about this, and we've asked the same questions. He's just put in a petition to Yahweh. He's waiting, kind of like you, kind of like me. The, uh, the request is being processed. But uh, the heavenly computer hasn't spit out the answer yet. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablets that he may run that reads For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will suddenly come, it will not tarry. I had a wonderful friend, adopted Greek father in the Lord named Brother Jimmy. He was my interpreter for nearly every meeting I ever preached in Greece, and and I was privileged to be there 14 times. And... uh, On more than one occasion, we would talk, Jimmy and I, about church matters, dealing with other ministers, in his case, superintendents and this and that. And he said something more than once, and it stayed with me. He said, Brother Joe, if you're ever in a conversation that's real important, and there are facts that are being discussed that are kind of real important, maybe time sensitive, he said, when you come to a conclusion, when you come to an agreement, or whenever the thing is finalized, whatever it is, write it down. Or get the person giving you the information to write it down. He was real big on faxes. There were emails back then, but he wasn't doing that. But he liked faxes. And I said, really? He said, I can't tell you how many times something has happened by way of a discussion or interaction with some other man or woman of God or some higher up or some organization. He said, and then later on, there was a lot of controversy about that meeting, about who said what, when, and what the decision was, and where we're supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, I was always able to produce the evidence. He said, I wrote it down. I got it on paper. People make promises, but there's something about writing it down. Amen? Amen. Forgive the personal reference, but I think I've mentioned it before. I served one church as pastor, and I didn't ask about it, but they called me to a meeting to explain what I was going to be paid and what the benefits were and this and that. But guess what? I didn't write it down. They didn't write it down. (laughs) Year after year after year went by. The salary never met what it was supposed to be from the beginning. And when it was all over, they owed me $30,000 in salary. And when I resigned with two weeks' notice, that wasn't acceptable to them either. They fired me. So they wouldn't have to pay the two weeks' vacation that I was taking. And what did you say about it, Pastor? Nothing. Why bother? It wasn't in writing. What'd you do? Forgave them, of course. Forgave the church, but I didn't forget about that money, right? I looked to the Lord. I said, I, obviously, I, don't, I forgive them. But Lord, do you know that did one right? You've heard the story. It's in one of my books, I think. Within about three years, through individual gifts from several different people, not related to to salary, Barb and I got about $27,000, just under $30,000, and got out of debt. So God's payday isn't always Friday, amen? But boy, wouldn't it have been better to have that as you're going rather than pile up debt and then have to get it canceled? Why didn't you do that, preacher? Because I didn't write it down. 
They didn't write it down. I got your attention now, don't I? Amen. Good, good night. No. I guess I've also preached this too, right? I think you already got it. You're not going to forget this, are you? You don't forget about 30 grand, believe me, unless you're a rich preacher on TV. Two things really leap out of these three verses in Habakkuk chapter 2. The one is the spoken word. The second, the written word. We're going to look at both today. This guy's name, according to many Bible scholars, means embrace or embracing. I like to think it might mean that he embraced God as his portion in this life. He lived in a very turbulent time, just like you and I do. And I like to think that maybe that typified his relationship with the Lord. When everything was going south around him, he was clinging to, he was embracing the true God. Amen? He, along with his uh, fellow prophets of that day, Jeremiah, Nahum, and Zephaniah, had been speaking God's word to wayward uh, Judah, warning this rebellious southern kingdom of God about the coming judgment if they didn't change their ways, if they didn't stop serving false gods and turn back to the true one. You'd think they would have learned because about a hundred years previously, just about one century, their brother Jewish folk in the north, the ten tribes, which are normally named, called Israel in the southern Judah, the ten tribes about a hundred years earlier had lost out with God. They'd lost their holy place. They had been dispersed. How many have heard of the lost tribes of Israel? And some church groups say that, that they, they eventually became English folk, you know, and the king and the queen are related and so on. Well, they never really recovered their national identity. And at that point, it was the Assyrian nation that God used as kind of a big paddle to try to get the, the northern kingdom into right spiritual shape. Guess what? They turned to deaf ear and a blind eye toward Yahweh. And they decided to be forward believers. We've got a better idea. And judgment came. God used the nation of Assyria to conquer them, to plunder them, and they lost their homeland. You know what? History was just about to repeat itself. Within about 20, 25 years, the same thing was going to happen to the southern kingdom of Judah, Benjamin. How sad. This time it wouldn't be the Assyrians. They had been defeated by Babylon or what the Bible sometimes called Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans had conquered Assyria. They were on their way to defeat Egypt and conquer Egypt. And guess what? They were going to take care of Judah on the way. And these prophets, just like previous prophets, had been speaking, had been preaching, had been warning. And it didn't look like the southern kingdom of Judah was going to listen either. Now, if you, have, if you read the previous chapter, you find out what the prayer was that Habakkuk had prayed that he was waiting on. The one that was being processed, that the heavenly computer hadn't spit out yet. And basically, if you read the first chapter, he's praying and he's asking God this question. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the wicked get ahead? I'm trying to be Mr. Nice Guy. I'm trying to be Mrs. Nice Guy. They get the gold mine, I get the shaft. What's going on? Yeah. Why do the, why do the wicked, in this, this case, the wicked nation of Babylon, if you think the Assyrians were ungodly, Babylon really topped that. Why do the wicked prosper? That's what he's asking God. He asks, and as we see here, God answers. But you know what? When he prayed that prayer and asked that question, do you know God could have just as easily turned around and asked him a question? You're asking me, why do the wicked prosper? Let me ask you, why do the godly turn from God? Why don't you answer my question? I've done everything I can for you. I gave you a blessed land. I gave you as a gift a place for you to inhabit. My spirit led you there, went before you, sussed it all out and planted you in a land with cities you didn't found or establish and wells you didn't dig and vineyards you didn't plant or tend and houses you didn't build. It was walk right in. And what thanks do I get from you? What praise do I get? You're serving other gods. You're leaving me in the lurch. But God didn't ask him that question. Instead, he did answer. And Yahweh, he was answering me. And he was saying, write the vision and make it clear on the tablets, so that one who is reading, he will be running on it. The message here, very clear, write it down. 
Get this that I'm telling you in writing. Keep it before your eyes. Say it. Listen to yourself say it. Talk to other people about it. Write it down. Do you know this is what we celebrated last fall? How many remember? 500 years since the Protestant Reformation took place. Since Martin Luther said enough is enough. We are not going to continue accepting tra tradition when it goes crosswise of God's word. One of the big, big teachings and doctrines that came out of that monumental event of the Protestant Reformation was this. Sola Scriptura or Scripture alone. The Bible, our only rule of faith and practice. Now, why did that have to be decided on and reaffirmed and made public? Because the church of the day didn't believe God's word was only the Bible. They believed God's word was the Bible plus the teaching organ of the church tradition plus the statements of the head of their denomination when he felt he was speaking as the successor of Christ. Three things make up God's word for the denomination that was in charge of the Christian church in the time of Martin Luther. God's word, the Bible, plus the church fathers, plus the teachings and pronouncements of the head of their denomination when he was speaking as God's vicar on earth. That can cause problems, can it? If you haven't, get my little book on the Lord's Supper, you'll find that the church fathers regarding who the rock was that Jesus was going to build his church on, the church fathers disagree among themselves. So if we accept that word as equal to the Bible, which church father do we believe on that point? You, you follow? What, what do you, flip a coin? That's like flipping a coin with the devil. Heads you win, tails I lose, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a messianic, a Jewish believer in Christ who wrote a, wrote a very wonderful book about how to witness to his brother Israelites. And he said it's very difficult. And he said a lot of Christians don't understand this. They try to share the scripture about Christ with Jewish folk and they don't get excited about it. They show them scriptures and it doesn't seem to matter. Why? He said here's why. Among Orthodox and conservative Jewish folk at least, when they think about God's word, they're not just thinking of the written Old Testament. They're thinking also of something called the Talmud, which was their commentary, right? And more than that, they're actually taught, according to this author, from, you know, Jewish school on, when they learn Hebrew, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and get uh, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, if you're a girl. From, the, from early on, they're taught not only the Scripture, but the commentary on the Scripture. And this is what they're usually taught. If for any reason, in any place, in any doctrine or teaching or story, if for some reason the commentary differs with the scripture, go with the commentary. Well, how many Christians have studied the Talmud? Virtually none. We have no reason to. So if we tell them scriptures about the Messiah that the Talmud has a different impression of, guess what? We lose, amen? And they lose. They lose out on the, the blessing of God's word. Fast forward a little bit in the time of Christ, had a problem again with tradition. How many remember the master on more than one occasion said, you folks, by your traditions, nullify God's word. The Bible, he says, says, honor your father and your mother. By the way, that does not mean say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. It's talking about money. Honor your father, your mother. He said, but your tradition says, if something I'm supposed to give them, I declare as a gift to God, then I don't have to give it to them. That was a tradition. He said, and guess what? <laughs> that gift didn't go to God either. They just said, this is, uh, you know, I, I know I should give this to my old man, my old lady to help him out. But, you know, I've already, I've already made a vow that this, this money, this is going to God's house. They didn't do that either. Where did it go, folks? <laughs> yeah, in the hip pocket or wherever they kept their wallet. Yeah. And what did he say? You've nullified the word of God through your tradition. What does tradition do? What does not writing it down do in terms of spiritual matters? According to Christ, if you study him in the Gospels, he said tradition did, did three different things. First of all, it transgressed or it went beyond the Bible. How many of you know there are whole denominations that require their men of God, women of God to be celibate? The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not teach enforced celibacy. The Bible says it's a gift. It is a gift. Some have it, some don't. And so some folks that might want to serve in the ministry in a particular denomination, 
but do not have that gift of celibacy, guess what? They can't express their calling if they believe that this word is true. You guys tracking with me? See how practical this is. It's not written down, but it's accepted as equal to what's written down. And that's a problem. It, tradition can sometimes go beyond God's word. It can nullify it, as I just meant, meant mentioned. And guess what else Jesus said it does? It causes us to leave God's word. In one gospel account, he said tradition causes us to leave God's word in favor of the tradition of man. Just imagine that. Leave behind good news so you can pick up some bad news. Leave behind something that is settled forever so that you can have something that might be worth another week or so. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go there. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. I, I was in a church. Big, 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 big meeting was scheduled with the board and different things. And uh, my associate called every, all the board members and said, don't, don't forget. Now this is, oh, I know, I know. Called this one person in particular who was a troublemaker. He said, now don't forget, you've you got to be at that board meeting. This is very important. We're designing some very important stuff. Oh, I know, I'll be there. Next week, the board met and he wasn't there. He wasn't there. So my associate called him. He said, hey, we're fixing to start the board meeting. Where, you, where are you? Well, I'm not coming. You're not coming. You told me last week you were going to be here. No problem. That was last week. So my associate says, wait a minute. You're telling me your word's only good one week at a time? I said, what did he do? He said, I could hear him just lay the phone down. I, I could hear him walk away and sit down. I could hear him sitting, in the, sitting on the couch. <laughs> just left the phone on, but... I wonder if my friend should have gotten it in writing. I will be at the board meeting this day, this month, and have the man sign it. Probably wouldn't help, but we'd at least had evidence. We did our part. He didn't do his part. How many tracking with me? Write it down. So important. Go by the written word. When the wicked king Jeroboam established a separate Jewish faith to suit him and to keep his people he had his own worship place. He anointed and appointed his own priests, had his own sacrificial system. And the true men of God, the Levites, said, Hey, what's going on here? How dare you think you can have a separate worship of the one true God? How dare you anoint and appoint your own priests? Can they show you a pedigree? Can they show you a genealogy where brother, uh, father, son, father, son, etc., etc. Can they show you the family line that we can't? We've got ours in writing. This is my dad, my grandfather, etc. And it goes all the way back. Can you do that? He knew they couldn't. They had their right to serve as priests in writing. His priests did not, and they appealed to that. See how important that is. By the way, we don't have that today, do we? Now, pastor... Why should we listen to you? Well, what right do you have to be in the ministry? You can ask that of any man of God. Let's see your genealogy. And we want to see your pedigree. Who are you related to? How far back does your ordination go? You, know? you don't have that in the New Testament. Have you noticed that? One big reason. We're not in the Le Levi line anymore. Jesus didn't come out of the priesthood line, did he? He didn't come out of the priestly line of Levi. He came out of Judah. Judah says nothing about anybody serving as a priest. That's why ministers of the New Testament don't even think about that stuff. Some denominations do, but men of God don't. Why? It doesn't apply anymore. There isn't any genealogy. Well, I've got one. So do you. You are of God, little children. Isn't that good enough? I'm a blue blood. You know, we've got, we're red bloods. We're royalty. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The spoken word is not enough. Let's move on now to the written word. Why did Yahweh tell Habakkuk to write the vision, to make it clear on tablets? Here it is. So that the one who is reading, he will be running on it. Did you know that this applies to our natural lives also, our natural secular lives also? The importance of writing it down. Some people say, well, you know, I just love you to death, honey. I found this wonderful apartment. Oh, it's everything you'd ever want. I decorated it for you. I know what colors you like. And 
I think it's time to take this relationship to the next level. Shall we move in together? And everything within the girl, if she's in her right mind, is saying, eh, eh. if she has any spiritual hearing at all, she should be hearing a, eh, eh, eh. if she has any spiritual knowledge, she should be seeing a blinking yellow light or a flashing red light. For, for what purpose? To alert her to the fact that this is a little boy. She's not marrying a man. She's marrying a little boy. After all, honey, what's a piece of paper? Well, among other things, when you show your true colors and the marriage goes south, that piece of paper entitles me to a big chunk of what I deserve, some of your money. You know exactly what that piece of paper means. Get it in writing, right? Even in the natural, secular life we live, it's important sometimes to write it down. A marriage certificate is a commitment of the heart. You show me your love without your works, and the true man or woman of God says, I'll show you my love by my works. Where's the marriage certificate? I'll sign it. When's the blood test? Let's go. Barb knew I was serious. I feel like my blood's supposed to stay inside. I just look at somebody getting blood drawn, and I see all the colors of the rainbow and all the stars of the sky. And I can't faint. I'm just like my old man. That would be easy way out. I can't faint. I just suffer, you know. We, you need to get a CBC. What, 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 what? Now, wait a minute. Is that, is that a finger prick? No, no. This is the real deal. What, 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 what? I usually turn, turn away and start talking in tongues. You, some of you old timers know. I told you what happened when I went to get married. But I was serious about marrying Barb. I mean, I, I put my arm where my heart was, you know. Back in Pittsburgh, you had to get a blood test to get a marriage license. And I put her out, you know. I said, I don't like this. I'm just telling you in, in, in front, I don't like this. I said, I'm not going to faint on you, but I won't like it. I don't think you will. He just ignored me, poked me, you know. Turned the other way. I start, boom, I am start talking in tongues, you know. I could see him out of the corner of my eyes. Eyes got like this. <laughs> what is this, you know. <laughs> but I got the blood test. Works, works uh, affirm our faith, Yes. It's easy to say something. It's, an, it's not so easy to do it. Write it down. Do you know there was an anonymous little book written in the 20s of the last century? And, uh, oh, I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people re uh, read it. It was written by a very wealthy person who wanted to remain anonymous, didn't want to, people to know who it was. But uh, I think it kind of got around who it was. But in any case, real, real simple book. I think it's like 50-some pages. And uh, the, the thesis of the book was very simple. Find out what you, it's talking about your secular life, your natural life. It's just as important as the spiritual. This man says, find out what you really want in life. Not what you wish for. Oh, I, I wish I could visit France. Oh, I, I wish I could retire at 50 instead of 60, whatever. I wish I could spell retirement. But anyway, f f f f find out what you really want. Not what you're wishing for, but what you actually definitely want, a desire. Maybe five, six things. It could be uh, ten. Write them down in the order of importance. That's the first thing he said. Write it down. Write these things down. Secondly, this is deep. Secondly, look at that list, morning, noon, and night. More often if you can. Look at the list, morning, noon, and night. Number three, don't tell anybody about your plan. Don't tell anybody what your heart's desire, what your goal is. Write it down. Look at it at least three times a day, more. And don't tell anybody else about it. Do you know that agrees with the words of Jesus, doesn't it? Yeah. How many know Jesus spoke about goals? He spoke about desires coming into reality, didn't he? Yeah. He said, when you as a human person, when I as a human being want to do something, an earnest desire, not just a wish, something that really burns inside, we want to do it. He said, whether you're building or whether you're battling, write it down right? Who goes to war with another nation without first finding out if he's got enough troops? Who builds a tower without first sussing it out, writing down, drawing the, the, the uh, architectural plans to see whether it should be built this way, that way, or, and how much is it going to cost? Jesus said that. Even as a natural person, 
in order to su succeed in life, run the numbers, count the cost, whether it's building, battling, or whatever. Write it down. Think about it often. Don't share that with other people. Why? What we think and talk about becomes bigger. Would you like something from another one of these minor prophets that aren't as important? No. The, another one of these little short books, Micah 2.1. Everybody say Micah 2.1. We've got two friends in heaven, Habakkuk and Micah. We won't be embarrassed when we meet them. Hi. Oh, you're, a, 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 we won't be doing that. You're Habakkuk. God bless you. I remember hearing a message at the crazy church I went to, 2018. Micah chapter 2, verse 1 speaks about this concept of, of even in the, in the natural, writing something down, how important it is. Woe to them that devise iniquity or lawlessness and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. How many see that? They write down, in this case, what wicked scheme they want to accomplish. This burning desire. See, this will work for good or evil. According to the scripture, according to the prophet of God, these people write it down. They think about it at night, right before they go to sleep. And while they're sleeping, their subconscious mind will do all it can to show them how to put into practice what it is they're trying to accomplish. That works not just for good things, but for bad things. When they wake up, it's in the power of their hand to do what they wanted to do. Isn't that something? How many have heard of a positive example of that? Dr. Cho's first book was called Dream Your Way to Success. And there he talks about writing it down. Young lady wants a husband. He would say, what kind? How old? What, where does he work? How much money does he have? What type of person? Write it down. I'm believing for a car, Pastor. Great. What kind of car? Write it down. What color? What model? What price? When do you want it? When do you want it? Write it down. Dr. Cho had a burning desire, not a wish, a burning desire to build the largest church in the history of Christianity. And guess what? He did. He did. He was preaching to nobody. He said, I, had my, I closed my eyes and I saw thousands. You know why we're still here? We wrote it down. We wrote it down. Around the turn of the century, the Lord, we'd been just a typical local fellowship, and that's great. And, and, and the Lord said, focus on the Internet. We had had an Internet ministry for about seven years, but we weren't doing a lot with it. Focus on the Internet. We did. Up to that point, we had about 45 nations we were in touch with because of shortwave radio and other things. Within just a number of years, we doubled that. Now we're 165 countries. When we first started the school, I wrote it down. I thought about it. I, I, I imagined it. I dreamed it. Love to have 10,000 students from maybe 100 countries. How cool would that be? 10,000 people that have studied the scripture who are going to, according to psychologists, they're going to influence at least 100, maybe 250 people in their life significantly. And their ministers, so many more than that. Wow, just 10,000. They could be influencing a million or more than that. Well, guess what? We're pushing close to 20,000. Not from 100 nations, but almost 200. Think about it. Plan it. Write it down. You may hit it or you may go beyond it. You may get what you wanted in a different way. Some of you have heard about the dreams I've had. Many. You've had similar. Our church from the outside didn't look like much. You got inside. It was like the TARDIS. Wow! Huge building on the inside. It was so strange, this one dream. But it was empty. Looked like small on the outside. Inside was huge, and it still looked empty. I prayed about it. The Lord said, most of your congregation is outside, all around the tri-state, including ministers that are preaching your stuff, all across America and all around the world. Most of the members you have, you don't see. <laughs> they're here, but they're not here. How cool is that? I'd rather see them, but, you know, it's, it's just saying. Just saying. Write it down. Look at your neighbor and say, write it down. Yeah. Yeah. What about that third thing about goal setting? We write it down, look, think about it three times a day or more, and don't tell anybody. Even Jesus said that. When he sent his disciples out to get the Passover ready, he said, salute no man by the way. Don't talk to anybody by the way. Why? They might talk you out of it. You're going where? 
Uh, well, we're going to see this guy that's supposed to have an upper room front. Well, you're, he's done. Well, who? How will you know when you see him? Well, our teacher said he, he'll have a water pitcher. Really? Do you know how many people carry water in pitchers? They might have never had the Passover. They may have never had the institution of the Lord's Supper if they blabbed. You and I tell, tell people what we're on, earnestly desiring. Many people talk us out of it or give us a new goal, theirs. Is this practical or not? I hope so. I really need this job. No. Um, <laughs> salute no man, by the way. Yes? So that the one who's running, running, reading, I should say, he will be running on it because, write it down, because the vision, it will, it is still for the appointed time and it presses on to fulfillment and it will not lie. It will not, it, if it will delay, wait for it because coming, this is a Hebrew way of speaking, ask Solomon, wait for it because coming, it will surely be coming and it will not be delaying. And guess what? Guess what? About 20 to 25 years later, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came through, just like Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Nahum and Zephaniah had been saying. They came through. They sacked the city, just like what happened to the northern kingdom about 100 years previous. And these people lost everything they had that had been given to them as a gift because they didn't turn back to God. Maybe they were kind of like, Habakkuk praying the same prayer. Why do the godly, why do the wicked prosper? And God had probably been asking them, why do the godly turn from God? They wouldn't listen. It delayed. It delayed. This concept of knowing there was an appointed time, and even though it looked bad, and it looked like nothing was going to change, that Habakkuk and other godly people would just live surrounded by ungodly people forever. Even though it looked like it was never going to change, it was going to eventually. And he had it in writing, and it happened. This gave Habakkuk, and it should give you and me faith today to stand where we are in difficult times. That prophetic word was kind of interesting. Even when it's completely dark, trust in Yahweh. Amen. Trust in the unseen one. Trust in the unseen one. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming, amen? And he's going to balance the scales. If it doesn't always happen for us in this life, most of the time it does if we're faithful. But if it doesn't happen completely in this life, it'll happen when he returns. He's going to make everything wrong right. Amen? He's going to reward your patience and mine. On the positive side, not only do God's judgments come to pass, like happened here, but... But the godly desires of the righteous will be fulfilled. They will come to pass if we have faith, pa faith and patience, if we're faithful. Brother Cho got just exactly what he believed for. Many, many people can testify likewise. They received that car. They got that job. They had that promotion. They received that unexpected blessing. They had that healing. The relationship situation that was so tangled got sorted. The ministry was birthed anew, whatever the situation is we are thinking about. We didn't tell anybody. We didn't let them poison our heart of faith. We kept on keeping on. We didn't back up, let up, give up, or quit. And our faith and patience were rewarded. Isn't that good news? The Bible says a desire satisfied is a tree of life. Looking for something good to happen in your life? Have a godly desire, not just a wish, but a burning desire? Write it down. Think about it at least three times a day, maybe more. Don't tell anybody else about what you're believing God for. Write it down. Father, thank you for what you've written down in your wonderful word. We can debate it. We can discuss it. Thank God we can't change it, neither can anyone else. When you say something we see as negative, like a judgment is coming, it's coming, and nothing can change it. When you tell us something good is coming, it's coming, and nothing can change it. 
We aim like Habakkuk to wait for it because we know you're faithful who promised. Father, bless folks that participate in this particular part of your tillage, your farmland, your pasture. Lord, bless those who pray, who attend, who support, who serve. Bless people, Lord, that aren't even literal members of this fellowship, but cheer us on from the sidelines around the tri-state, across this country, all around the world, particularly people, Lord, that have decided they, they feel to partner with apostolic ministry. They're not members of the local church, can't be because of distance, etc. but they, they want to partner with the apostolic end of it reaching around the world. Thanks, Lord, for the gifts and givers and seeds and seed sowers and tithes and tithers, people that sacrifice and others you've placed in your body with the gift of giving who are, who are so, 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 so blessed to be able to make up the difference regarding what some of your children are unable to do and others are unwilling. Thanks, Lord Jesus, for letting a harvest come back a thousand times more than what they've let go of. Let that seed multiply and bear fruit here and hereafter. Holy Spirit, thank you now for this time to come around the table that the Lord Jesus instituted after that last Passover. Thank you, Father, that as we pray over these elements and distribute them, as they're received, and as the wonderful words of the Lord Jesus, those words of institution are spoken over them, Thank you in advance for the miracle that takes place when this risen flesh and blood of Jesus suddenly is found in, with, and under these emblems at the same time so that we dine on both. We don't understand it, Lord, but we believe it. With Martin Luther, we believe in this sacramental union given to us through this miracle called the Lord's Supper. Bless us, Lord, spiritually and physically. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise. Backyard soldiers, little boys We fought the enemy with little toys Sticks for swords, hands for guns Every battle always won But as we grew and went our way Forgot about our soldier days. No more swords, no more guns, no more battles to be won. But we were wrong, we did not see. We still had it. Now we stand friend with friend, we are
Picture the cross this morning. Receiving from the cross, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes as we break this bread and eat, as we pour this cup and drink. See it in your mind's eye this morning. And scripture says, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave to them saying, this is my body, which is being given for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is being poured out for you.
Praise God. God's good, isn't he? All the time. If you need prayer this morning, we're always here to join our faith with yours and believe God for your miracle, whatever it is that you need from the Lord. Uh, Wednesday, we are going to be talking about some pitfalls preventing prosperity. Don't teach much on finance, and I felt like it was time. And I uh, did about six, six lessons and then uh, talked recently about supporting the poor and whatnot last week about supporting the ministry. Um, but there's something that's very, very current that Paul wrote about many, many years ago. It's very current, though. It's, it's something that can happen on the negative side, you know, regarding finance. And uh, it's actually kind of two things in one. And I really encourage you, if you can clear your schedule for 45 minutes, how many would rather not make the mistake in the first place rather than having God fix it, you know? Um, so it's kind of preventive medicine financially. I'm not going to tell you, you know, how to work the system or, or whatever. Uh, but... Um, it's spiritual advice that's very, very practical. It'll even help you watch TV the right way. Yeah. It, it'll it'll kind of give you a wake-up call regarding who you're getting spiritual advice from. Um, and two ways of living. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday and some pitfalls preventing prosperity. If you need prayer, we're here. There's coffee out there for you and I encourage you to uh, fellowship. If you need prayer... You may have a brother or sister pray for you like we did last week, and that was really, really used of the Lord. And we appreciate God ministering in us and through us. Yahweh bless you, protect you. Yahweh, make his face shine on you and be gracious, merciful to you. Yahweh, lift up his countenance upon you, grant you his shalom. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, we're here.